When Australian Eric Neeras went diving for shellfish in 2007, he was nearly bitten in two by a great white shark. Everything went black. I started to get shaken horizontally. I was getting eaten alive. The great white shark is top of the food chain. Hardly changed since the dinosaurs, it's the ultimate killing machine. This full-grown shark is now targeting Cape Howe on the south coast of Australia. The strong currents here attract fish, which attract seals, which are the shark's favorite food. It's the rich marine life at Cape Howe that also attracts fishermen to these waters. Eric Neeras is one of them. He specializes in abalone, a large sea mollusk and culinary delicacy. I call myself an underwater laborer. <laughs> Basically, we crawl around the bottom of the ocean measuring abalone and collecting them. It's a pretty strenuous job. If I don't catch a certain amount of abalone each month, I don't make any money, so I can't pay my bills. To tell you the truth, that day, I was only half-heartedly getting ready to go to work. Being school holidays, I could have found something more interesting to do, like take the kids out to a park or the movies and have a family day out. Today, Eric's 16-year-old son, Mark, is joining him. He's working as a deckhand. Mark was only out with me to make a bit of pocket money for himself. He'd only deckied for me about four times. So he wasn't actually what you'd call experienced at all. Mark isn't as comfortable as his father in these waters. Every time we've been out before, like, we've seen sharks, and there'll be sharks, like, just fly in front of our boat. I don't know, it was just a morning, like, it was real freaky morning, like, real quiet and, like, no noise or nothing like that. Sort of think to yourself, something's gonna go bad, something's gonna go bad. Mark's intuition is dead on. A hungry great white has returned to these familiar waters where it hunts its favorite prey, seals. In the water, Eric breathes through a long hose that feeds him oxygen from onboard tanks. He also wears special clothing. I wore a lead blonde weight vest. It has about seven millimeter thick lead plate sewed inside it. And it fully covers your back and most of your chest. And um, that keeps you on the bottoms. Although shark attacks are extremely rare, Eric knows it's a hazard that goes with the job. When you're a diver and you're in, you know, their domain, you've always got that inkling in the back of your mind. Um, I wonder if a shark will show up. The water was actually dirtier than I normally would like to dive in. That's when you start to even imagine that there's something out there and the hair on the back of your neck will stand up and... A seal or a school of large fish go past you and all of a sudden you'll start to think, OK, I wonder if there's something chasing them. Surprise is the great white's best tactic. Stealthily, the hungry animal closes in on its next meal. Seals are very cognizant of sharks being in an area, and it's not unusual to see them haul out under those circumstances. Unlike the seals, Eric hasn't yet picked up on the shark. I sort of wound my way around the boulders and the kelp and just sort of hugged the bottom, and after an hour, I filled up my first bag, and I sent that bag up to Mark. I 
remember looking up at Mark at the hull of the boat, I could just see it. And I thought, beauty, Mark's doing his job. He's right above my air bubbles. He's a good kid. He's following me. He's not too far away. Mark's not sure why, but he can't shake the feeling that something's not quite right. It was just weird, like, and I kept going over the side of the boat and looking down and didn't feel right. Didn't at all. So I was getting into cruise mode. You know, you sort of get into a daydream mode where you just work and forget about everything else. It's so peaceful too, you can only hear the hum of your air regulator. wetsuit are doing a pretty darn good job of making themselves look like a seal or a sea lion. second it was daylight, the next second everything went black and a really nasty vice-like pressure crushing my chest and upper back and I wasn't really sure what had actually happened to me. The shark has taken one supersized bite. Eric's head and shoulders are in its mouth, one arm is down its throat. Inside the jaws I couldn't see any light, it was just all dark there because I was facing the back of his throat. My right arm was actually hanging down the shark's throat. My arm refused to work anymore, it felt like it was broken. The head in a seal is the working end of a, of a critter and sharks know that much. If they can bite off the head, the rest of it's an easy meal. I've never experienced anything like this in my whole life. Eric's lead vest has stopped the shark's razor-sharp teeth from slicing him in two. But this only makes the animal more determined. Then I started to get shaken horizontally with a really hard threshing motion. When a shark head shakes, what it's doing is dragging its teeth, especially its upper teeth, through the prey from side to side like this and sawing through the prey. By thinking, oh, is this the end? Is this what it's like to die? I was actually getting eaten alive. A great white shark has half swallowed abalone fisherman Eric Neeras. All that's saving him from certain death is his lead diving vest. My instinct kicked in and I had a free left hand and I started to feel around the jawline of the shark and I reached up higher and I felt a slimy membrane. I realized that must have been the eye. Eric gouges his fingers deep into the shark's eye. Anything we can do that demonstrates to the shark that we're big and strong and are willing to fight back is a good thing. Surprised by the counterattack, the shark begins to loosen its hold. And I started to wriggle out backwards a bit, and I wasn't sure if I was going to get out or not. And just as I thought I was going to be free, the bottom jaw closed, and I felt these teeth going into the back of my head, into my skull. I twisted as hard as I could again, trying to gouge the eye, and the shark reacted again. The animal at that point reacted by letting go as a matter of defense for its own self. Uh, sharks aren't dummies. Eric caused it pain. It realized that it had a formidable uh, foe there in the water. The shark was looking at me like face to face. Um, it's the scariest sight I've ever seen. As Eric's blood seeps into the water, the shark waits for its prey to weaken even further. 
the white shark will bite and let go its prey to cause exsanguination. It leaves it to bleed to death till it gets weaker, and then it comes in to finish it off. You really think your time's up. You think, OK, it's, it's got me. It, it can fly into me and finish me whenever it likes. When uh, you're in a situation where you feel you're going to lose your life, you get a uh, few thoughts that flash through your mind. And uh, I thought about Mark. He'd never see me again. And I knew the mental effect that would have on a 16-year-old. Sort of tried to calm myself down. And I thought, well, if I panic, um, I'm only going to be dead anyway. Eric is faced with a life or death decision swim to the surface or try and hide from the shark somewhere on the sea floor. The water was going a dirty brown color around me from blood loss. Blood attracts sharks and that's when I made the decision that I was going to go to the surface. And as the shark slowly circled me, I spread my legs and, and arms out a bit so it could see that I wasn't a seal. I was something, you know, different to what it normally would eat. Eric heads for the surface. It's a gamble that can cost him his life. If the animal reacts to the sudden movement, Eric's finished. Searching for abalone on the sea floor, Australian Eric Neeras has been half swallowed by a great white shark. He's managed to fight free, and now he needs to get out of the water before it strikes again. Those marble dolls with the black painted eyes, a glossy black color, that's the color of those shark's eyes, just a dead, dead black. And when you've got those eyes on you, and they're only like one to two meters away, it makes you feel very small indeed. Really had a, a tough job holding back the fear. Eric breaks the surface, but the 15-foot monster is still circling below. The whole time the shark was just below me, going around and around my flippers, and it could have, you know, uh, taken me any time it wanted to. The shark didn't want to just rush right back in because the last time it did that, it didn't have a pleasant outcome. Dad! Dad! I'm coming! All Eric wants is to get out of the water fast. I screamed at Mark that I needed help. He came straight over to me. Eric makes it out alive, but his wounds are horrific. I suffered a broken arm, a broken nose. Four teeth went into the back of my skull, and my other teeth marks are in my chest. So thank God for that lead vest, or I wouldn't be here now. Eric tried to return to abalone fishing, but fear kept him out of the water. Now he works on dry land as a security officer. I can't even say how much it hurt still to this day, like, the knowing that I could have lost the best thing in my life, and, like, I just don't know how to say it. Like, there's no words that can literally say it. When you've had a narrow escape and you sort of feel you've been given a second chance, um, it makes a great deal of difference to your life, and all of a sudden you start to appreciate things that you didn't even think about before. We're pretty good mates. My young Mark and myself. Ever since people first ventured into the seas, we have been afraid of the monsters that lurk below. The great white shark has always been the most feared, infamous as a ruthless predator that will kill anything. But the smaller bull shark is actually fiercer packed with more testosterone than any other creature on the planet, these naturally bad-tempered sharks can attack their prey in as little as two feet of water. When a bull shark bites, almost nothing 
will make it let go. In the summer of 1916, a horrifying series of shark attacks shocked holidaymakers in New Jersey. Originally blamed on the Great White, these attacks were in part the inspiration for the novel Jaws. But many experts now think the villains were really bull sharks. The first victim that summer of 1916 was Charles Epting Vansant. He started shouting for help, but people assumed he was calling to a nearby dog. When a lifeguard finally reached him, his left thigh was stripped of flesh. Van Sant bled to death before reaching the hospital. The Coast Guard was sure this was a freak accident, so beaches remained open. A fatal decision. Just five days later, a second killing. The ocean turned red when a hungry shark went for Charles Bruder. It bit his right leg clean off. Bruder bled to death before he could be rescued. The next attacks were even more terrifying. The scene of the crimes, 16 miles inland in a freshwater creek. 12-year-old Lester Stilwell was playing in the water with friends. They noticed what they thought was an old log in the water. It started swimming towards them. Suddenly, the shark pulled Lester under, and he never surfaced. A man entered the water to bravely search for the boy's body, but he too was fatally wounded by the bloodthirsty shark. Experts now know that great whites can't survive in fresh water, but bull sharks can. Bull sharks may actually be responsible for many more attacks than previously thought. Chuck Anderson knows just how aggressive a bull shark can be. When training for a triathlon in 2000, he was savagely attacked by a bull shark, an attack that changed Chuck's life forever. He was just freight train. And even though I hadn't seen it, I knew exactly what it was. The Gulf of Mexico is famous for crystal blue waters and white sandy beaches. But this is America's shark attack capital. In fact, there are more shark attacks here than anywhere else in the world. Almost anyone that's uh, been in the water uh, have been close to a shark at some time. The sharks see the humans. But humans don't always see the shark. And public enemy number one is the ferocious bull shark. It will target almost anything that moves even humans. Bull sharks mean business. Uh, when they attack, they truly are going after a human. And what they start, they mean to finish. Bull sharks are persistent, and I think for that reason, I would be a lot more concerned about a bull shark than, than a white shark. It's early morning, and this bull shark is already on the hunt. It patrols the shoreline because it knows sooner or later something tasty will swim by. Chuck Anderson, a former football coach and father of two, is training for a triathlon. Today, he intends to train in the ocean. He is joined by a friend, Richard Watley, and four-time Hawaiian Ironman champion, Karen Forfer. I was very honored to be swimming with Karen that day. She was such a good swimmer. The male ego of keeping up with a 64-year-old lady kind of kicked in automatically. The swimmers know there are sharks in these waters, but they're prepared to risk it for the love of their sport. I always was a little bit leery when I got out there. I was constantly looking around and that sort of thing. But still in the back of your mind, it was kind of always there. And, and I remember thinking, you know, I, you know, gosh, I was a little bit nervous out there that day. Picking up on the erratic movement in the water, the bull shark moves in closer to investigate. 
Humans are not a natural part of the sea. As a result, we as humans are engaging in provocative acts simply because we splash so much, we make so much noise, we do so many other things that are attractive to sharks. Chuck's friend swims alone in a deeper water where there is less of an undertow. Karen and Chuck, however, feel safer sticking together closer to the shoreline. A decision they will soon regret. After five minutes, Chuck finally gets into a groove. His mind is now focused on outswimming Karen. Then we got to a, a place that I knew were an old set of piling pier was built there, and it blown down during uh, Hurricane Frederick back in the late 70s. That's essentially an artificial reef. The first various invertebrates grow on the piling, then fish come to eat those invertebrates, then bigger fish come to eat those, and then sharks come to eat those. And so it's a natural area where, as a shark, one would go to find food. Unwittingly, the swimmers have now entered this shark's natural killing ground. Karen kind of went ahead of me. I'd like to say I was chivalrous and letting her go through the pilings, but actually she was kicking my rear end pretty good. The shark observes his potential meal as the swimmers make their way past the pilings. I remember looking at my watch, and it was 6.38 AM. I took two more strokes in the water. It nailed me. Uh, felt like a linebacker getting run over by a fullback. He just freight trained me. He hit me and knocked me out of the water. A classic bump and bite attack. The shark was getting a feel for uh, the size and the power of whatever it was going to bite. And even though I hadn't seen it, I knew exactly what it was. I felt like he knew that I was out there in his territory, and he wasn't very happy about it. My big fear was that there was more than one. There was a school of sharks, and that I was in real trouble. And I started hollering for Karen, who had gotten a pretty good ways away from me at that stage of the game to get to the beach, get to the beach now, hurry, get to the beach. Karen races to shore, but Chuck is too far out. He's on his own. Well, it's, a, it's a pretty helpless feeling. You know, there was no way I was gonna outswim anything that was out there with me. Chuck desperately searches for any sign of the shark. And I was treading water, and I remember looking around on the surface. What Chuck can't see is that the shark is gunning straight for him. I've been a scuba diver before, and when you're down on the bottom, you can see around you. Uh, that part of it you can kind of come to grips with and handle because you see what's happening around you. When you're on the surface of the water, I, I didn't know what I was dealing with. I didn't know where it was coming from. I didn't know when it was going to get to me. I put my face in the water. When I did, up from the bottom was, was the shark coming directly at me. Chuck begins to panic. He knows the shark could finish him off with one vicious bite. Chuck Anderson is training for a triathlon when he's ambushed by a hungry bull shark. The animal only bumped him the first time, but now it's going in for the kill. I realized that if I didn't get a hold of myself, that if I panicked, that I was going to be in a lot more trouble than if I tried to have a plan and protect myself. And just instinctively, I threw my hands out to push off of him. Chuck's move is disastrous. I took all four fingers off my right hand, just clean as a whistle. White knuckles were showing through. I mean, they were literally exposed. The bull shark is probably one of the most powerful biters. Its head is extremely big and robust. It has huge muscles, jaw muscles. It's a very strong predator in terms of its jaw morphology. Undoubtedly, the shark just missed. I'm sure the shark would have much rather had 
um, the entire lower arm if it could have grabbed it. The taste of flesh sends the animal's killer instincts into overdrive. This time, he's determined to get a bigger bite. I thought, he's not going to just swim off. There's blood here. He's taking a bite of me. He's going to keep coming back. I realized I'm not going to survive. Fighting a 300-pound shark in open water is a losing battle. A big fear that I had was that he would attack me from the back. You know, I couldn't protect myself if he came from the back and I couldn't see him. That's when he hit me. And I remember kind of losing a little bit of my breath. He hit me that hard. Bull sharks will hit the victim over and over again. And they'll actually single them out amongst a bunch of people. If there's mul multiple people in the water, sometimes they'll go through the people and hit the same victim over and over again. Chuck doesn't have time to react because the shark's fin is once again slicing through the water towards him. Everything goes in slow motion. You're kind of in a fog. I think it won't ever end. It's just a strange, eerie type of feeling. My kids kept coming to mind, and I just couldn't imagine ending my life without being able to tell them I love them. I remember thinking if I was going to survive, I had to get mad. The shark opens its massive jaws and drags its prey into the deep. As I pushed off of him, he actually latched his mouth onto my right arm and took me immediately down to the bottom, 12, 15 feet of water. He started doing the gnashing, the feeding frenzy. Just threw me around on the bottom of the guff like I was a rag doll. The shark's only mission is to eat. He tries to chew off Chuck's arm. If there's one species that one could say that actually goes into a feeding frenzy, I would say it's a bull shark. Uh, once they get into the attack mode, you can't change their mind. I'm a pretty big guy. It was ridiculous how easy he was throwing me around. I never thought I'd get back up to the surface. The testosterone-crazed bull shark hasn't finished with Chuck. And now, the athlete is on the verge of drowning. A bull shark has viciously attacked triathlete Chuck Anderson. The animal has been thrashing its human prey for over a minute. It was at that stage of the game that me and the good Lord had a conversation, and I asked him to get me up to the surface so I could get a breath of fresh air. And all of a sudden, I felt my heels dragging on sand. Now the shark's dragging him at high speed towards the beach. In its determination to eat Chuck, incredibly, the shark drags him onto a sandbar. The swimmer seizes his only chance of survival. He couldn't move. I had my arm in his mouth. I was trying to hold my face away from his mouth so that he wouldn't snap at my face. And it was a real unique feeling as I was hitting him, and I kicked him a couple of times. And uh, I was doing everything I could to get away from him, but it wasn't, wasn't phasing the shark at all. I mean, I know people say poke him in the eye, but when you're dead in front of a shark and the eyes are on the side, you know, I couldn't see his eyes. And being on the surface, that type of thing, I didn't have time to collect my thoughts to, OK, let's poke him in the eye. Or it, it, most of it's instinctive, and my instinct was to hit him and, and kick him and that sort of thing, trying to get away. I couldn't get my arm out of his mouth by pulling, so I worked it up and down twice and jerked real hard. And when I did, it completely degloving my arm. A hand popped off in his mouth. There really wasn't a sense of, oh my gosh, I've lost an arm. It was more of a sense of, oh my gosh, I survived. You know, I'm very fortunate I should be dead. The shark has lost the battle. It waits for the next wave and propels itself out to sea. Couldn't get a helicopter in uh, to, to pick me up and take me to an, uh, a trauma unit. 
And so I remember one, one paramedic turned to the other one and said, man, if we don't get him to the hospital in the next few minutes, he's going to die. And I thought, whoa, time out, hang on. That's not an option here. Now, I thought I was fine. And the guy said, coach, you're, you're blue, you're losing blood. We can't stop the bleeding. If we don't hurry up and get you to a hospital, you're in real trouble. And I thought that that was the first time that I really had time to think about the fact that I might die. And that was a real scary moment. Chuck is rushed to the hospital where what remains of his arm is amputated at the elbow. I was halfway to the hospital before I ever really came to grips with the fact that, hey, you don't have a right arm anymore. And I promise you, it's not going to come back. Despite the tragedy, Chuck Anderson is determined not to let it ruin his life. Just 10 months after the attack, the father of two competes in an able body triathlon and wins. My kids were on either side of me, and we crossed the finish line together. And, uh, geez. And I was proud as his dad that I could show my kids, if you work hard enough, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. The bull shark may be the most aggressive shark in coastal waters, but in the deep, the oceanic white tip is the greater menace. About three quarters the size of a great white, this shark rarely encounters people. But when a ship goes down or a plane crash lands on water, the deadly white tip will target human prey. In fact, the white tip is responsible for the largest ever attack on people. Just after midnight on July 30th, 1945, the Japanese torpedoed the USS Indianapolis. The battleship had delivered the first atomic bomb and was on a new mission in the West Pacific when it was hit. Of the nearly 1,200 sailors aboard, 900 are thought to have made it into the water alive. Sharks were most likely drawn to the wreckage by the sound of screaming, splashing men. The white tips went into a feeding frenzy. The men's horrific ordeal lasted five long days. By the time rescue boats arrived, more than 500 sailors were missing. Many had been devoured by the hungry sharks. Although the bull shark and the oceanic white tip may be more aggressive, it's the great white that has entered popular folklore as the ultimate ocean-going serial killer. Its size and power mean it will always be seen as the most terrifying of all sea creatures. In 1830, Joseph Blaney was attacked by a great white while he was fishing off the coast of Boston. The shark capsized Blaney's boat and pulled it right under with the fishermen still in it. The boat resurfaced, but Blaney was never seen again. 130 years later, during a spear fishing competition, Australian Rodney Fox was attacked by a great white. It's one of the worst shark attacks anyone has ever survived. I was held through the water faster than I could swim. It was right at the edge of my life. I was in really big trouble. This great white shark is swimming the waters of South Australia, looking for food. He's around 20 feet long and 4,000 pounds. He is constantly on the hunt. As Rodney Fox knows, it will eat almost anything that moves. December the 8th, 1963, at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, is a time I will never, never forget. It changed things in my whole life forever. Today, it's Rodney's chance to retain his crown as South Australian spear fishing champion. He's been training hard and determined to win. 
despite the choppy water. The weather wasn't very nice. It was a little bit windy, but it, it was something I had worked for. I had done so many deep diving and exercises and much practice holding my breath, and I'd made two beautiful spear guns. Rodney is aware of the risks. 18 months earlier in this bay, his friend was attacked by a shark, which bit deep into his leg. The word shark was sort of out there in the, in the background with the hell and death and devil and that, things like that. I was well aware that I could actually be attacked, but of course I didn't believe that it would be me. The winner today will be the person who catches the largest number of different species in a five-hour period. The gun went off and everybody raced towards the, the shore. And I knew that um, I had to work hard and you didn't get the fish on the surface. You had to be down there with them. You had to approach them in such a way where they didn't think you were an aggressive attacker and then you would slowly bring the gun around and sneak up on them. Rodney isn't reckless. He takes precautions against a shark attack. What you do is to, to attach the fish onto a float that uh, you tow with you on about 10 metres of uh, ski rope. If any sharks came along looking for the bleeding fish, they could take them without getting near you. This great white shark may be miles from Aldinga Beach, but its powerful sense of smell soon picks up on the blood in the water. It stealthily makes its way towards Rodney's tempting catch. Because of their injuries, any speared fish is going to be releasing bodily fluids, um, blood and other things into the water. A shark, can, for instance, can smell a single drop of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's pretty darn good. Blood from the fish that had been speared was slowly going out to sea. In the tide, it was putting an odor trail several kilometers down the coast. The blood, the struggling fish in the water, any electrical charge it picks up or anything like that, the shark would be attracted to that and probably swim upstream to find it. I was so focused on doing well and looking for fish that I couldn't really think about anything else that might happen. I got uh, a fairly large boar fish, which was really a prize fish and gave high points. And I thought, it could be a lucky day today. After almost four hours in the water, Rodney comes in to weigh his fish and assess his chance of winning. I found out that there was one fish that I really needed that would build up my points. And I cast my eyes over the area and thought, where would I find this particular species? And I thought, well, well out past the reef in very deep water. Rodney heads back into the ocean, past the reef. Venturing off on his own puts him on a deadly collision course with a natural born killer. There's safety in numbers. Um, that's why birds are found in flocks and fish are found in schools. Spear fishermen should be found in groups. Once you isolate yourself uh, from the rest of the group, you become more vulnerable. Alone and out on the edge of the reef, Rodney has no idea he's swimming directly towards the shark. a shark that has Rodney in its sights. Humans aren't denizens of the sea. Um, we don't see very well in the water. We don't smell things. We don't feel the vibrations of, of animals moving. And so we're not attuned to watching over our shoulder for predators. 
Rodney tracks down his elusive prey. All he needs to do now is spear the prized fish, and the competition is his. I was just squeezing the trigger when... The shark's massive jaws clamp around Rodney's chest. It begins thrashing him violently. White sharks often engage in the marine version of shock and awe. Nothing is better as a predator than to have a sudden strike of overpowering strength to put your prey item in trouble. The gun was knocked off my hand. The mask was knocked off my face. And I was actually hurled through the water faster than I could swim. I don't know why, but I thought, oh, I've been hit by a train. And even though I knew I was going fast, I have this memory of the shark's tail slowly going through the water. As the shark drags Rodney deeper and deeper, it uses its razor-sharp teeth to try and sever his body in half. The great white shark has uh, broadly triangular teeth that work just like a steak knife, but in tandem, it's like having a big saw. The fear of dying overcomes the fear of normal pain. The adrenaline that it braces into your body gives you special powers to be able to think and do. And as I was being forced through the water, it said, gouge his eyes, gouge his eyes. Rodney reaches around the two-ton beast and digs his fingers into one of its eyes. Miraculously, the animal lets go. but it has no intention of giving up on a spear fisherman. Gouge the eyes or the gills of a shark, and that is probably not what the shark would expect. So the texture, the taste, the response, everything is not what they expected. The animal abandons the attack at that point. Not quite sure what it is. Doesn't mean they won't come back. The fear was unbelievable, right at the edge of my life. I was in really big trouble. I knew I may not make it, but it never occurred to me to give up. Just keep fighting. Rodney looks down into the deep. And a picture that stays with me now is of this bright red water, which is my blood, and this great big head coming up from down below with those big triangular teeth towards me. And I thought, what can I do? What can I do? I have nothing to protect myself. I'm gone, I'm gone. The shark turned, instead of going for me, swallowed the whole fish float with the fish. It looks like Rodney's cheated death. But then, a violent jolt. He's still attached to the float, and the shark dives and pulls him under. I put my hand on my stomach, trying to find the catch, but it must have swung all the way around. I couldn't find it. Rodney is quickly running out of oxygen. He can't hold his breath any longer. Those were the last few seconds that I was going to have of my whole life. In Australia, spearfishing champion Rodney Fox has been savaged by a great white shark. He survived the first onslaught, but the shark has swallowed Rodney's fish float, and the float is still attached to Rodney. As I was being dragged down, down, down into the water, I was running out of air, and I thought, I'm gone, I'm gone. I can't hold on any longer. I'm going to have to breathe water and drown. With no hope. Rodney gives up the fight. The shark has won. Then, the line snaps. Instantly, I thought I have more chance. I've got life. I can make it to the surface. Rodney has to get out of the water before the shark returns for more. 
unbelievably, a boat was coming over to find out what all the bright red water was. Rodney has only just escaped with his life, but his injuries are horrific. The lung was punctured, the spleen was uncovered, the main artery from the heart to the stomach was just left there, one nick, and I've died. Rodney has cheated death, but before long, the champion spear fisherman returns to the water. Sharks came at all angles from me. The little glistenings of the water turned into sharks. And I remember saying to myself, if you don't control this right now, you're going to be no good. And I had to shake my head and get rid of the sharks and turn it back into little glistening things again. I wasn't meant to go. But you can't get much closer to death than that. There are over 375 species of sharks swimming the world's oceans. But despite their fearsome reputation, only four target humans. Shark attacks are very rare. Fatalities, more so. But when a killer shark has us in its sights, it's the shark that rules the ocean.